This is Chicago. At the dawn of the 21st century, Chicago's media was dominated by a handful of major corporations. But a resistance movement arose to free Chicago's media from their clutches. One player in this movement is the Chicago Independent Media Center and its TV show, Chicago Independent Television. The Independent Media Center is a worldwide network of grassroots correspondents committed to using the tools of the media for promoting social and economic justice. You are watching this month's dispatch from the Chicago Independent Media Center. In this episode, we'll learn the decade-long effort to win a strong net neutrality policy at the FCC. We'll also follow protests in the wake of revelations of a secret police black site on Chicago's north side. We'll learn about preventing Exelon from pursuing corporate welfare in an attempt to stump renewable energy. Then we will hear from Dr. Ricky Pott on an EPA window of opportunity to comment on big oil. Mr. Bishop, I want to use this picture on the front page of our next issue. Oh, come down, Nancy. We can't print a picture like that. The paper is read by people all over the city. Just think what a picture like that would do to the reputation of our newspaper. I don't think we should hide things just because they're unpleasant. How do we stop things like this if we don't let the people know they're happening? Here at Exxon, we hate your children. We all know the climate crisis will rip their world apart, but we don't care because it's making us rich. That's right. Every year, Congress gives the fossil fuel industry over $10 billion in subsidies. That's your tax dollars lining our pockets. Making a fortune destroying your kid's future? At Exxon, that's what we call good business. ExxonHateYourChildren.com The net neutrality fight reached a turning point in February 2015 as the FCC voted to strengthen the policy of non-discrimination of internet content. The future of the internet is the future of everything. There is nothing in our commercial and civic lives that will be untouched by its influence or unmoved by its power. Jessica Rosenworcel, FCC Commissioner. I will call for the yeas and nays. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it. The ayes <laughs> On February 24, 2015, the Federal Communications Commission, in a stunning turnaround and dramatic win for the public, voted to reclassify the Internet into a legal framework intended for public service, thus preserving the principle of net neutrality and improving its long-term chances for survival. While the reclassification got scores of coverage, what got far less coverage was the work that made that vote happen, work that was more than a decade in the making, and which I got to be a part of for nine years of that effort. This is the story of that work. On March 14, 2002, the FCC voted to change the legal framework governing internet modems, which gave much greater strength to corporations who sought to privatize the internet and introduce discriminatory pricing. The potential effects were dramatic. The internet, long regarded as a free and open medium, could become squelched in the wake of corporate consolidation of internet service providers who could then set up a pricing regime that would turn the internet into just another version of cable television. That reclassification vote in 2002 got barely a whisper of media coverage, and the three commissioners who carried it out would soon become high-ranking executives of the media apparatus they voted to support. Grassroots activists began to agitate on the issue, and one internet service provider filed suit against the FCC in a case that, in 2005, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. That case, NCTA versus Brand X Internet Services, resulted in an affirmation of the FCC's right to reclassify the Internet if they so choose. That ruling, when it appeared on Slashdot, was the reason I got involved. My stomach turned at the outcome, and I realized that media activists were in for a big fight. The fight would move on to Congress, where Internet service providers lobbied to lock in the FCC's reclassification into law. In 2006, the vehicle to do so was called the COPE Act. I was volunteering with the group Chicago Media Action, 
which worked to help stop the bill, which was sailing its way through a Republican Congress greased with lots of telecom cash and nary any public awareness. Our main strategy to fight on this issue was to make it an issue in every way we reasonably could. We wrote blog posts and newspaper op-eds and indie media features and went on community radio and made short video features, a lot of video features. We even organized a protest that spurred a national series of protests under the shared banner, The National Day of Outrage. The hope was that increased public awareness would lead to increased public involvement when both awareness and involvement were lacking. All that work and the work of many allies on the local and national scales paid off. The COPE Act came to a screeching halt when then-Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska was captured on audio tape, one recorded by an activist sounding like a buffoon, describing the internet as a series of tubes. That recording gained national attention and greater awareness, embarrassing COPE Act supporters who couldn't bring the bill to a vote, and the bill died from inaction. The flurry of activity and attention also affected the FCC, which to its credit did pass a net neutrality policy in 2007, but one which was doomed to failure because of the reclassification of the internet that the FCC carried out in 2002 and which the FCC refused to change back. Sure enough, the policy was defeated in court in 2010. The FCC responded later in 2010 with a second net neutrality policy, but again without changing the classification back to one that benefits the public and in 2014, the policy was again defeated in court. After that second defeat, word leaked that the FCC would effectively surrender its net neutrality policy to Big Telecom. Just as word leaked, the public interest community mobilized to call for a reclassification, and resoundingly so. The scale of the response broke all FCC records for comments on a docket in the agency's 80-year history, with about 4 million responses. Coverage, local and national, continued. Protests at the local level and those coordinated on the national level arose to ever greater levels. Even the president, seeing the level of concern, announced his support for reclassification. And I delivered a series of lectures on net neutrality in the summer of 2014, which were then later compiled into an e-book and published. And Big Telecom, with stale old talking points, was caught flat-footed. Signs in early 2015 showed hints of surrender by the big ISPs. And on February 24, 2015, in a room packed with activists and allies, the FCC voted to reclassify. Lawsuits may loom from the big ISPs, and Congress may huff and puff over the FCC's supposed overstepping its boundaries. But the reclassification, thought to be a dead letter in early 2014, became live policy in early 2015. It gave net neutrality a much greater chance to win in court. Court victories aside, the real win and future wins to come arose from the actions, large and small, of concerted individuals and groups defeating organized money. It is a story to inspire us all. The Guardian of London revealed a black site run by the Chicago police at Holman Square on Chicago's west side. This is the first of two segments we'll feature about the site and of grassroots protests against it. Interrogation rooms for hours on end to deny them access to their attorney. Things like not allowing them access to toilet facilities and food. Those were the kind of conditions that the city of Chicago paid out $16.5 million less than two years ago. So excuse us when we get a little upset when we find out that there's an off the books site. Tom Emanuel says, trust us. We're doing the right thing. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but you've lied to us about enough other things that we're not gonna just take your word for it. So, Mr. Mayor, we demand an immediate, impartial investigation of Holman Square. CPD, the world is watching you. The country is watching you. You should have expected us. <laughs> yeah. Who's paying for what and how many connections are there between 
CPD, Homeland Security, CIA, FBI, and everybody else. These are not bad apples. This is a hemlock tree. It's poison. <laughs> when individuals are empowered by a contract and have no threat of accountability, they can't be expected to exercise self-restraint. And everything that happens inside of this facility is off the books. Our objective here is to get hard evidence because the burden of proof now lies on the Chicago Police Department. For the sake of even the smallest amount of basic humanity, we the people of this nation declare this facility and all others like it to be non-conducive to living life in a way that promotes peace, freedom, and dignity as a human being. So I say to you, march my comrades, and let, this, uh, let these people know that you're not happy, and you're not gonna stop until the job is finished. March for those who cannot, for those who are too afraid, for those who are still locked up, and for those who have lost their lives at the hands of the state-sponsored killers. My name is Beatrice Boyce, and I'm a candidate for Alderman of the 24th Ward. I stand with you wholeheartedly to call for an investigation to the lives that have been tortured by this facility. We hear a lot what goes on in our neighborhood, and in some cases, we've stopped marching. We stopped fighting for those that matter. And I'm an alderman that stands for the people that have been forgotten about. It's easy to go in the boardroom to conduct business, but it's hard to be out on the street and fight for the common folk that we forget about, but they make up the majority of this population. We're here because individual rights have been violated. If the Chicago Police Department has, hasn't gotten anything to hide, then open up the doors. Yeah. Open up the doors. Yeah. Anytime that we see unjust laws, anytime that we see people's rights being violated, we will fight those unjust laws. I come as a spokesperson on the behalf of the family of Dakota Bright, Rashad McIntosh, Rakia Boyd, Deshaun Pittman, and the list names of other um, individuals who, who have been shot and killed by Chicago Police Department. Over the past four years, there have been over 300 Chicago police shootings. Over 90 of them have been fatal. We demand justice. We demand something for these families. Woo! What kind of country, what kind of system breaks the most fundamental rules of humanity and law? A system that can only survive with such means a, is a system that has lost all legitimacy. We demand that all people arrested in Chicago be booked immediately upon arrest and given access to a phone with which they can call an right. attorney. Think about humanity instead of thinking about that badge. With detaining people um, without access to a lawyer, 18 hours being shackled up, and, and even having a, uh, a person die under the care, per se, of, of the Chicago Police Department, that's a huge violation. They need to stand up. Uh, and just say no. You know what? We're not going to break the our. Uh, we're not going to uh, violate people's rights uh, just because uh, higher ups are telling us to. We have got to band together as a city, as a community, and a, as a unit. Freedom first. Freedom first. another segment about the infamous Holman Square black site run by the Chicago police.
fighting for those that matter. And I'm an alderman that stands for the people that have been forgotten about. It's easy to go in the boardroom to conduct business, but it's hard to be out on the street and fight for the common folk that we forget about, but they make up the majority of this population. In the 24th Ward, 80 to 90% of African-American men have exes on their background, and they deserve not just a second chance, but another chance, and it's up to us to make sure that they have it. I'm just letting you know I'm with you. I stand with you. I stand for the investigation. I don't know how many other political officials are aware of this, but I would definitely contact them to make sure that we wrap our hands around you and make sure that this, this does not go uncontested or not brought to the forefront of the American people. Thank you. because it's a holiday or a, or a feel-good session, we're here because individual rights have been violated. If the Chicago Police Department has, hasn't gotten anything to hide, then open up the doors. Thank you. Open up the doors. We thought that the Red Squads were eliminated 15 and 20 years ago. But some, I guess we didn't get the memo. If anybody did, raise your hand right now. <laughs> I don't see any hands. Anytime that we see unjust laws, anytime that we see people's rights being violated, we will fight those unjust laws. I stand with Travis, I stand with Chicago Anonymous, and I stand with everyone who stands against unjust laws and the rights of the people. We have got to band together. Special interests don't represent the community. And anytime you see someone's rights being violated, then we'll continue to be out here. I'm hoping that you'll be back again next week, tomorrow, as long as it takes. We will shut this down if we have to. Because what do we need? We need freedom first. Yeah. I want to hear it. Freedom first! 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 Come on, keep it going till we get the next person up here. Freedom first! Freedom first! Send a clear message to City Hall that we need freedom first! 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 Hi, I'm AJ Signeri from the Outfront Show on Q4 Community Radio, your source for activism in the arts. Listen to us at QUE4.org and 1680 AM at select locations throughout Chicago. Next, we learn from NEIS, the Nuclear Energy Information Service, about the efforts in preventing Exelon from pursuing corporate welfare in an attempt to stop renewable energy. They, Exelon made $24 billion worth of profits last year. So they are really hurting. They are really hurting. <laughs> I want everyone to really feel sorry for Exelon and buy a cupcake for $25,000. Nope. I think just stay rent. No. Uh, they want a billion and a half dollars in bailouts through rate increases. We figured if we helped them out a little bit, maybe we could get that number down. So we're having a bake sale to benefit Exelon to keep the bailout as low as possible. Exelon claims five of its reactors in Illinois are unprofitable and they're threatening to close them and terminate 2,300 jobs. But in 2014, the total revenues for Exelon amounted to over $27 billion. They had an operating net 
income of two and a half billion dollars, and their CEO got a benefits package worth 17 million dollars. So it doesn't sound like a company that's really hard up for cash. Actually, closing the nuclear plants would be a good thing for Illinois. It would usher in renewable energy that much faster. Uh, we do have some concerns about how the workers would be treated. We've been arguing with legislators they should enact something called Just Transition to help workers and communities with the transition to a renewable energy future. But overall, it would be a good thing if nuclear plants close in Illinois. The Exelon legislation uh, is going to be heard for the first time in the Senate Energy Committee. So this thing is going to go on fast track. Our fear is that the politics as usual in Springfield is going to prevail and the good legislation which will create 32,000 jobs in the renewable energy sector uh, won't see the light of day. It's up to citizens to get off their butts to stop a two billion dollar bailout for Exelon and support renewable energy. Tell their legislators to vote no on Exelon, vote yes for the Clean Jobs Act. Exelon for the last two years has championed a national campaign uh, called Nuclear Matters. The purpose of the campaign is to seek bailouts for failing nuclear plants around the country, but a bigger picture item is that the real purpose is to kill renewable energy and energy efficiency, which cuts into Exelon profits. So we really do have a war, a, a nuclear war, going on nationally against renewable energy, spearheaded by the Exelon Corporation. The legislature has just started its session and it's assigned the Exelon legislation to the Senate Energy Committee. It will also be heard in the House as well. But uh, today is the first hearing. There'll be a few more hearings on this. And then eventually, the suspicion is that House Speaker Mike Madigan is going to convene a big powwow to horse trade away different provisions of the bills. That's where we usually lose. We can't afford this to be horse traded. This is an all or nothing campaign. Either Exelon bill goes down or renewable energy is going to go down. What people should do is oppose House Bill 3293 and Senate Bill 1585. This is the Exelon legislation. It's designed to kill renewable energy and provide almost $2 billion worth of bailout money to the Exelon Corporation for unprofitable new plants. Now we will hear from Dr. Ricky Ott on an EPA window of opportunity for the public to comment on a new EPA policy on big oil. Hi, my name is Ricky Ott and I direct ALERT, a project of Earth Island Institute. I'm also a survivor of the Axan Valdez oil spill, a commercial fisherman, a scientist, and an author turned activist. And I'm here to share with you some news that it's about a small something, but it actually has huge ramifications on the future of oil transportation and actual oil drilling in this nation. This might have slipped your attention. There's been a lot of focus on bomb trains, exploding trains, contaminated water, people getting evacuated, massive oil spills. That little something is that our national contingency plan, the framework for responding to oil spills across our nation, is up for public comment and review. We have until April 22nd. Why is this important? That plan, our national framework, was written over 40 years ago, and it was written for mostly oil spills at sea of conventional oil that floats. It doesn't really address what we do with unconventional oil and gas, the tar sands oil that sinks, the bomb trains oil that explodes. So what we're seeing across the nation right now with exploding trains and our waters like the Yellowstone River and in Illinois um, and more getting contaminated, people having to be evacuated, alternative water supplies brought in, none of this is covered in our nation's contingency plan for oil spill response right now. And this hasn't happened where we've had a massive oil spill offshore where we actually added enough chemical poison to amount to the sixth largest oil spill in our nation. Now clearly this is not a plan to mitigate oil spill response. So right now EPA is gathering itself from what lessons it has learned and it has opened up the rules for public comment, our national contingency plan. This is a good thing, except for the fact that EPA is proposing a sea change in system thinking. It's proposing that we shift from 
mechanical containment and recovery of oil spills to increased use of chemicals. Really? We want chemicals in the Great Lakes, we want chemicals in our water, in our rivers where we drink. The other thing that EPA is proposing is that after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, we learned that something huge was missing from our national contingency planning process. And that was a space, a pause for local communities, local people to infuse their knowledge and wisdom into the planning process. What are the places we would like to be, have protected? Where are our water supplies, our schools, our hospitals? What is it that, how do we protect public health? EPA is now proposing to usurp that power and relegate it back up to the state level planners. So alertproject.org is spearheading national effort to try to have our voices heard. It's time to speak up to protect our homes, to protect our waters, to protect the things we love, and let EPA know that we would like local knowledge infused into these local contingency plans, that we want ordinary people in charge. If the oil shippers, whether it's oil in the Arctic or in the Gulf or up and down our rivers, if they do not have viable contingency plans, legally, under the Clean Water Act, they cannot be shipping the oil. So now is the time to weigh in with EPA, submit comments by April 22nd, support alertproject.org's comments, and let EPA know that it's important, you care. There are 135 million Americans who live within 20 miles of the coast of the Mississippi River and of our Great Lakes. These are oil corridors where we are currently shipping dangerous products through our cities and towns. Please weigh in and submit comments with EPA by April 22nd. Look for suggestions on how to do this at alertproject.org. Thank you. In 1914, Woodrow Wilson signed the bill that created the Fed. He thought it was one of the worst days of his life and he had destroyed the country. He hadn't destroyed the country, he destroyed the world. Put an end to this, now! Make ChicagoActivism.org your homepage, all the news, events, and contacts for activism in Chicago. The Chicago Activism News aggregates content from over 100 activist organizations from around Chicago and Illinois.